Okay, welcome to our discussion of futures. Um, since this is our first lecture, I'm just going to point out a couple things. Um, if you come across an error, a typo, um, let me know and I'll give you an extra credit point. for So any errors, like if the answer is wrong or there's a blatant typo, let me know because I'd like to get that fixed. Um, the other thing is I won't go through every single detail, like some of the things I'm assuming you can just read through, like the underlying definition, but I'll try to hit the highlights with the lecture videos. All right, so in terms of futures, first thing I want to make point out to you is the distinction between a forward and a future. A forward contract is basically anything you want to negotiate today for something to take place in the future. Usually they're customized, but then you also face counterparty risk. For example, if I wanted to buy a puppy, I might negotiate, I'm going to give you $400, and once it's weaned from its mom, I'll pick it up in six weeks. So six, I basically enacted a forward contract. Now, the counterparty risk is I show up six weeks later and say, oh, the puppy's gone. I found someone else who wanted to pay me more. That's, I was counting on having a puppy. So I face that risk when I enact forward, a forward contract. And it's also somewhat customized um, in that, say, I wanted to buy gold in three months and I might need 50 ounces of gold or 150 ounces of gold. Um, I could pick whatever size I want. I just have to find someone who wants to buy or sell the opposite side of the contract. Um, futures contracts are the same general type of thing. They're for a you negotiate it today for a transaction in the future. However, futures are standardized. If you wanted to buy a gold futures, they are a specific quality of gold and a specific size, specifically like 100 ounces of gold. So if I wanted to negotiate for 50 ounces, that you can't get a futures contract and match that perfectly. They come in 100 ounces. So you can go in increments of 100. I could buy two futures for 200 or five futures for 500, but I really can't get the 50 ounces. For that, I would need a forward if I needed an odd lot in effect. Um, the other benefit though of a future um, this, the standardization allows for trading because um, basically everyone knows what you're getting. It's hard to find a secondary market for a forward contract. What if after I make the negotiation to buy a puppy six months from now, I change my mind. It's hard to sell that to someone else. I got to go find someone else who wants to buy a puppy. Um, whereas futures, because they're standardized, everyone kind of knows that. And there's organized exchanges that trade futures contracts. Uh, the other thing about futures contract is that they're guaranteed by the exchange. Usually when you purchase or sell a contract, even though the transaction doesn't take place in the future, you put up some amount of money initially. And then those transactions, the value of that position is marked to market every day. And so that the, the exchange basically doesn't lose any money, but you may get a margin call. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. But in any case, futures, forwards, they're similar, but they're not the same thing. Um, all right, what else do we want to talk about here? Here are some standard features of a futures contract. It's, it'll identify what the commodity is or what the instrument is, the size, like gold is 100 ounces. I think gasoline's 1,000 barrels. I think corn is 5,000 bushels. Here's the interesting thing. Even though there are standard features for corn or standard features for oil, um, they differ between commodity or instrument. Um, so like euros uh, futures are not gonna have the same contract size as corn futures or oil futures. So in any case, but if you were to buy like a British pound future, that'll be like 62,500 pounds. There's a standardization for the specific contract. Um, when that matures, like three months from now, six months from now, um, how the contract will be closed, how are you gonna deliver it? Um, and what the price of that is. You're locking in the price today for a transaction to take place in the future. All right, in terms of figuring out, well, how on earth would you know what a price would be in the future? I'm gonna give you three links where you could do some amount of research on different um, contracts. So the first one I wanna take a look at is the CME Group, which originally stood for Chicago Mercantile Exchange. However, they've merged and it's now just called the CME Group. They specialize in futures. And if we were to scroll down a little bit, we can see there are agriculture futures, energy futures, equity futures, foreign exchange futures, interest rate futures, metal futures. There's all kinds of futures. Um, generally speaking, there's some sort of underlying risk people want to get rid of. If I'm going to sell corn, I'm a farmer, I plant corn, I want to lock in the price I'm going to sell it for, I want to sell a future. 
If I make cornflakes and I'm going to buy corn in the future, I want to lock in the price I'm going to pay for cornflakes. So in any case, there's a natural hedge for both buyers and sellers to lock in a corn future um, price in the future. So if we were to say, can I look at that? I'm going to click on nothing's happening here. Here we're making progress. Hmm. I'm getting a new internet connection tomorrow. Maybe I should have waited to tomorrow. All right. Here's what I wanted to point out to you from the CME group site. The big key here is it has this sort of, if you click on the contract, click on the contract specs, it'll tell you, how did I know corn sold in 5,000 bushels? Well, I've been to this site and I've looked at the contract specs, 5,000 bushels. And oddly enough, the price is quoted in cents per bushel. So like if we were to go back a second and just look at some of these prices, so if we look at some of these prices, like May 2020, 317-4, 324-0, that's like $3.34, but it's quoted in cents per bushel. That's just the standard way of doing it. This is sort of unique to corn also. This is like eighths of a cent over here at the end. Um, you might say, why are they quoting in fractions of a penny? The reason is they're 5,000 bushels, so it works out in the end to be relatively a sizable increment, even when you quote fractions of a penny and multiply it by 5,000. All right, so I wanted to point that out to you. Um, that's the CME group. You can look up contract specs. That's its big specialization, or at least from my perspective. Uh, technically, I guess I was supposed to look up British Pound. Um, let's try a couple other sites. You can do that on your own. Um, what about this Business Insider site? What is it good for? If we go to this Business Insider site, um, one of the things it's good for is, if I were to scroll down, let's just pick... I think I wanted to pick soybeans for some reason. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to go ahead and go with it now. Soybeans. If I click on soybeans, and there's obviously lots of different commodities I could have selected. Ooh, I got this neat little chart. And I could get a one-year chart or a three-year chart or a five-year chart. So if I was trying to figure out how on earth would I know what the price of soybean is? Well, here's what prices of soybeans have been for the past five years. And you might look at that chart and like do technical analysis and say, oh, I see a pattern emerging and now it's getting ready to jump back up or something of that nature. But in any case, here is sort of a visual depiction of historical prices. And then finally, if we go to this bar chart link and let's try to look at wheat price history. So if we go to the bar chart link and here's wheat here, this is sort of analogous. What I would say to for stock prices, we used Yahoo Finance to look up historical prices. This bar chart has good underlying data that you can download related to different. You don't have to just do wheat. You can pick other futures, currencies, and so forth and get historical price data. So that's the advantage of using bar chart is that you can access the underlying historical data. So there are ways of identifying what prices have been to get some sort of inclination as to what they may be in the future. Um, but why would you want to do this? There's two primary reasons. One is speculating. I just know orange juice is going to go up in the future. Um, that's sort of the underlying theme of the film Trading Places with Eddie Murphy. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that. I would recommend it. It's actually a pretty good film. And it is, it's dated, but it's still very good and it relates to sort of futures markets in general. All right. So if I thought the price of orange juice futures were going to go up. Let's say they're going to go up in the future. I might buy a future. That way I've locked in the price I'm going to pay. And so say three months from now, if the price is higher, I've already locked in the price I'm going to pay. If the price is higher, I can um, buy it and then sell it, immediately make a profit. So I'm speculating. I don't own, for, I don't have a use for orange juice futures, but let's just say I'm speculating. Or if I thought the price was going to fall in the future, I could lock in the price I'm going to sell it for today. And then three months from now, six months from now, whenever the contract expires, if the price has indeed fallen, I can buy it low and sell it at the price I've already negotiated from my futures contract. So there's an incentive to speculate, or at least the incentive exists. I mean, that's it's risky. I mean, I wouldn't encourage speculation. As I mentioned earlier, there is a natural hedge. Um, for example, a farmer who's planting crops and wants to lock in the price they're going to sell it for, that's sort of a short hedge. They would sell a future contract, lock in the price they're going to sell it for. Conversely, the cornflake manufacturer who needs to buy corn in the future, he would buy a future contract. That's a long hedge. So there's some sort of terminology you'd like to start to become familiar with. Forward, future, short, long, buy, sell. 
All right, there's a couple examples here, and some of the ones that um, require an answer, the answers are provided. To the extent that you don't, that doesn't make any sense to you or you need more exam um, an explanation, make sure you ask about any yellow highlighted cell as we come across them throughout the semester. That's what I'd like to spend the class time worrying about is answering questions. All right, futures trading accounts. This is, we've talked about this in finance as it related to sort of margin accounts going um, and uh, cash accounts. It's, it's similar terminology. There's an initial, if you buy a future contract or sell one, you have to put up an initial margin. Um, the contracts are marked to market every day. Um, if the value of your contract has fallen out of your favor, you might get a margin call. Hey, you got to put more money in here or we're going to close out your position because the exchange isn't going to lose money. Um, so in any case, uh, one other thing to be aware of, you might say, well, what if I'm a speculator and I'm speculating on, let's say, corn prices and I buy three futures contracts? Well, that's like 15,000 bushels of corn. What on earth am I going to do with 15,000 bushels of corn? Usually, the way you unwind a future position is you conduct a reverse trade. If you bought the future, you get out of the position by selling it. Or if you sold the future initially, you get out of the position by buying it to the extent that the future price should adjust based on as things change. So if the trade moves in your favor or not, if you want to close your losses, you just do a reverse trade as well. Very few futures contracts are actually delivered under the terms of delivery. Like no one, usually you have your own supplier. So if I am a cornflake producer, I have my own supplier of corn, I just worry about the price. I might use futures contracts to hedge the price. All right, so in any case, a reverse trade is the most common way of getting out of a futures contract. All right, so we want to be a little bit careful here to make the distinction. Cash prices or spot prices, those are the current price today for delivery right now. A futures price is a different price. That's the price for whatever the maturity date is. And usually at maturity, the cash price and the futures price should be the same. Okay. A couple terms that are kind of unique to futures markets are contango and backwardation. What on earth is contango and backwardation? Contango is the situation which I would consider to be most frequent. That's when a forward price is higher than the spot price. Backwardation refers to the situation where the forward price is less than the spot price. This seems weird because you think of if the... Uh, current price is higher than the forward price, um, you could, well, I don't want to get too carried away. Let's just say, in my mind, that's backward, and so the backwardation. One way or another, you want to come to terms with these two terms and what they mean. And I would say, well, contango, forward price, future price, greater than the spot price, backwardation, future price, less than the spot price. All right, to get some idea as to what you think the prices may be, here we've got some valuation methodologies. So if we were just thinking about a painting and an interest rate and a future price, well, basically you should at least, the future price should at least be what you could have earned if you had sold the painting today for $100. If the interest rate's 5%, that future price should be 105 Well, what if you could sell tickets for people to look at the painting? Well, that would actually reduce the future price. So if someone's going to give you two bucks to watch it, right, say the day before you would collect your $5 in interest, you really only need that future price to be 103 because you're going to get the other $2 from selling tickets to view it. Well, what if you have to pay to store the thing? Well, that would add. So you basically would reduce dividends or interest, reduce a future price, uh, carrying cost or storage cost add to a future price. And then interest rates relate to the uh, time value of money between now and whenever the future expires. So there's some general relationships between forward prices, spot prices, interest rates, benefits, and costs. What are some of those benefits? Things like uh, dividends or interest. Sometimes it's referred to a convenience yield. Um, and then the most explicit cost is storage. Like, what am I going to do with all this corn to hold it for three months before I can give it to someone else? Um, there's a nice quote here I'm going to allow you to read from the CFA curriculum that I think is relevant to our valuation of futures. Um, here's more specific, I don't know, maybe there's certainly more shorthand of spot futures parity. Well, that's this relationship. Cost to carry future. Well, that's this relationship. 
basically we're adding in a storage cost component here for the cost of carry method. Um, otherwise, it's the same thing as spot futures parity. A uh, couple examples of situations with the underlying solution. Note that it makes a difference. This T, like for three months, that's not one, that's three twelfths of a year. So like one fourth would be the T in this particular example. So we do want to pay attention to this. We're compounding or raising it to a power, but that power could be a fraction of a year. Most futures, most liquid futures have uh, expirations less than a year. All right, we got all kinds of problems here, or at least several. I got true false statements, problems um, with answers. Look at that. Um, some of these should be just straight application to the formulas that are in the notes. Some of these should be definitions or misdefinitions from statements in the notes. This one I would say is the trickiest. I don't have a flat out critical price, similar to the way you said, when would you get a margin call with a stock account? Um, we had a critical price formula. I want to you know, try to think through why is it $25.20? Why would that be when you would get a margin call in this situation? To the extent you can't figure that out, we'll go through a method to sort of think through that in class. But other than that, read through the definitions and uh, as you come across questions, be sure to either ask those via email or ask them in class. All right, good luck with your study of futures.